Welcome back to GA Fan TV. My name is Aaron. I'm delighted to be joined here today by Tipperary senior footballer and captain Connor Sweeney. We're going to be running through Connor's time playing for Tipperary, obviously looking ahead to next year as well. Looking back at, at that famous uh, Munster Senior Football Championship win two years ago, the journey to it and everything else, I suppose. Uh, first of all, Connor, we're chatting off air there. You're, you're keeping well and enjoying the World Cup and all the rest. Yeah, all good, Aaron. Can't complain. Um, thanks for having me on. Yeah, so you're after pulling me away there now from uh, from England and Wales. <laughs> it's the biggest boar fest of all time, so more than happy to be on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Hopefully, anyway, Wales can Wales can grab a goal and and sort of shut yes. them up. But I think I think they're still going through either way. Anyways, I think even if they lose, Wales really okay. Jeez. Uh, Eng England, oh, yeah, England, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah England. Wales are poor. Yeah. To be fair, Wales are poor. Yeah, yeah, no, they are. The, not not the best team in the world now. In fairness, probably probably not too different to to Ireland really when you think about it. Like if you were to take yes. Arab out of the Wales team, yeah, like, a lot it's of similar, bit, yeah. similar enough team really, isn't it? Like yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. How are you finding the, the I suppose the, the kind of break anyway from inter county football and everything else? Obviously a bit of a split season this year, kind of yeah. like the first first year they sort of properly brought it in. So how have you kind yeah. of found the, the, oh, the sort of break? Listen, yeah, good. Like um I think I'm on record, you know, um I suppose being all for the split season. So yeah, I've actually I've enjoyed the last two seasons. I think the split season has worked pretty well. It definitely has worked well for me anyway. Um because it was nice to actually have a full proper club season the last two years in a row. Um, you know, you're not just coming back the week before championship, which was the case up until now. So, yeah, so far so good. Um, we obviously bowed out of the, the Talton Cup and the championship early last year. So we've actually had a nice bit of time off. So it's actually nice to get back to a bit of training, to be honest with you. Yeah, and, like, and I suppose with the Talton Cup as well, like at least you do have... A lot of games sort of it's not like you've too long a layoff like if you are i suppose let's say knocked out of the championship early you go into the touching cup for the division three four team so at least you sort of do get a lot of games before you know the club season and a bit of, bit of a break and all the rest yeah exactly and i suppose even that's another thing with the split season i think the inter-county season is condensed now uh which i've always been in, you know in favor of um i just always felt it was just always too long um so yeah like the less time between games the better i think everyone's in favor of that from a player's perspective anyway 100 yeah i suppose going back to the beginning obviously for yourself growing up in in tipperary it's obviously a i suppose predominant hurling county really in in most people's eyes from the outside so sort of what sort of dragged you into to playing gaelic football or or how did gaelic football become the the number one sport in your eyes yeah, like I, I even go as far as saying Tip is just a mad sport county in general. Like, there's um, soccer is getting bigger and bigger. Um, rugby is always being big um, in the county as well. So there's an awful lot going on. Horse racing obviously is massive as well and stuff like that. Um, so look, I suppose like many GA players, it was just from an early age for me. Like, um, I play hurling and football with my club as well. So I played hurling all the way up as well. So uh, listen, it's just. I suppose it's the go-to sport, isn't it? When you come from a rural community like I do, um, just kept at it then. And obviously, um, I started getting good when I was, I suppose, a teenager. And uh, my first kind of my first experience of a blue and a gold jersey was under 16s for Tip, and then it just led to minor from there. I played my first year minor in 2007, um, and it kind of just kicked off from there, really. So um, that's kind of where it all spanned from, really. It's, the same old boring story, I suppose, really. It's just getting down to the pitch from a young age and it kind of took off from there, really. Yeah, like, I suppose it has been some rise for, for Gaelic football and Tipperary as well. Like, I mean, even when you you think of the, the minor All-Ireland success, obviously, you were part of an under-21 side that won a Munster Championship as well. Like, I mean, it's been some story for, for Tipperary football in the, in the last 10 years or so. Obviously, senior success in there as well, like... So yeah. you're clearly not the only one that's um you know sort of gained a huge interest into into Tipperary football. Yeah, no, like to be fair, um, you know, I, I think it's it's fairly obvious to say um that you know I I'm being lucky enough to be part of probably Tipperary's most successful period of football. It's it's been fantastic, um, you know, and I'd actually say we probably we probably got the ball rolling at minor level under 2007, um. 
2008, we got to a Munster final. Uh, we drew with Kerry in the Munster final below in, Tre- in Tralee or Killarney. Or sorry, it was actually in Cork and Porky Cueve. And we lost the replay. Um, so that was 2008. Then two years later, we won a Munster title 2010 below in Tralee. Um, obviously, fantastic being a part of that. It was our first time ever winning that grade. So that was a massive step forward. Like we'd, we'd massive quality in that side. And then obviously the following year was 2011 and the Miners won the All-Ireland. And I suppose it probably just, that kind of ignited, I suppose, a generation of players that were actually very, very talented. Um, and you'd see a lot of those players from the 2010 under uh, 20 team and the 2011 minor team coming to fruition at senior level over the next decade. So, yeah, it's definitely been probably the most successful time period um, as Tipperary footballers. And look, we were absolutely blessed to be part of it, really. Yeah, and was it a case that a lot of that talent was always there, in your opinion? Like, the talent was always sort of coming through, or was there huge work doing an underage level promotion in schools, or, or what do you think led maybe to, first of all, that's the success of that minor side, because I suppose yeah. it was quite rare for, for Tipperary minor footballers to, to win in All-Ireland. Yeah, look, I, I don't know. I mean, I was obviously, I was a minor for a couple of years before that, and to me, like it was everything. Like representing Tipperary at minor level was massive. Um, I was lucky enough to be captain in two thousand eight in my second year, but I always felt it was just a massive honour. And I'm, I've no doubt that other players um, who came after me and before me felt the same. So, but I think that's in every county. Like, where did the success come from? Um, obviously, that two thousand and eleven success. You know, the backbone of that team would have came from the high school which is here in Clamel, which is obviously the biggest town in, in Tipperary um, I think a lot of those players would have won the All-Ireland B football competition either that year or the, or the year previous so I suppose they were coming from a good school who have a good tradition of football here in Clamel, but also we probably just got lucky Aaron it was probably just a, a good core of players <clears throat> at that time and you see that happens everywhere like it's happening in Limerick with hurling at the moment it has happened in Dublin Kerry, like, you know, um, you just sometimes get a good core of players that you can actually work with. But then you need to have the right coaching as well. And obviously, a lot of those players as well were from uh, the big team here in town, which would be Clamel Commercial. So they would have been exposed to good coaching and, um, you know, good, healthy competition and lots of players from an early age. So that was definitely a big a big reason as to why maybe um, that team was so successful around around that time period as well. Yeah, and when when you came into the senior team then as well, like could you could you see even some of that sort of groundwork being put in the the hard yards from a lot of players and and everything else? Could you sort of sense that something was really starting to build even in the early um, years? Yeah, like I, I suppose when you see those when you see the minors winning in two thousand eleven, you you can't not but help but say like, geez, are we in for something good here over the next you know three, four, five years? But it actually took a lot longer than that. It um it was quite it was quite a slow burner. Um, and I suppose it just goes to show, you know, the difference in standard going from maybe 17s or 18s, even from 20s up to senior. It's a massive, massive leap, and it took a fair bit of um, adjusting. But yeah, I suppose there was a there was a there was a shining light there after 2010 and 2011. There was hope. Um, you know, I came into the senior team in 2010, and we were actually in Division Two. So prior to that, uh, John Evans had been the manager for two years and he'd actually taken Tipperary from Division 4 to 3 to 2. So I was coming in when Tipperary were at Division 2, which was a fantastic standard at the time. Um, I'm not even sure if we'd ever been up that high in the leagues. Um, so I suppose him, he was kind of at the time, he was a high profile enough manager for a county like ourselves. And he definitely got the ball rolling, to be fair to him. He kind of increased standards and you know, he, he, he got us rolling and he got us out of Division 4 and back-to-back promotions. And then he started getting the young players involved, you know what I mean? He started getting myself involved and Peter Atchison and Robbie Kiley and that a few of those players from, from that 2010 under-21 successful team. So it kind of took off from there then, really. Yeah, and you mentioned the, the 2010 championship, obviously, when you came into the side, obviously playing against Dublin. In the qualifiers, I suppose a, a rare enough occurrence in in some ways for the likes of Dublin and Tipperary to be playing each other in the qualifiers. But I'd say that was a great experience, great exposure. Our game was obviously on TV as well. Yeah, it was. Um, like, look, I mean, that was my first year. It's gas um, playing Dublin above in Crow Park. You just wouldn't have even have thought of it. But 
it's gas like the first four years that I came on the panel, we drew Kerry in the first four seasons. So it was getting knocked out of the first round of the championship for us. So you, you were kind of relying on the back door for those few years. But yeah, look, that was a fantastic experience. I got to play in Crow Park at, at, at the age of 20 and actually went quite well for me. So I was, I was more than happy. And I suppose when a game goes well for you like that in a stadium, like Crow Park and against a team like Dublin, you just get that bit of appetite to go again. And um, yeah, look, I, I'll never forget um, my debut that year, and I'll definitely never forget that Dublin game because, like I said, it was actually a game that went quite well for me. And when you think then that was twenty ten, sure they won the All Ireland in twenty eleven, um, and then sure they went on to do what they did after that. So like, it's amazing to think that we got a crack off them just as they were coming right, you know. Yeah, like it was, it was kind of mad. Like I remember, it, even as as a Dublin fan, like it was sort of following on from the the me defeat. And I remember even there was some sort of rumors and everything else that you know if Dublin lost, maybe Pat Kilroy was was going to be leaving and everything else. Like it was kind of a it was a crazy sort of game and experience and all the rest. But as you said, like great great experience to be out in Crow Park and testing yeah. yourself against a, a team like Dublin who. As you said, we're just about, you know, slowly. They didn't win the All Ireland that year, but they were sort of slowly building something sort of over the next, what, I suppose, 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. And like it was kind of, it was some experience for me personally. Like, I mean, I started off with Philly McMahon, like I was marking him for 60 odd minutes. Like, and um, I think Michael Fitzsimons came on then to see out the game. So, like, you know, for me, it, it probably didn't get, like, even they wouldn't get any harder than that but like you probably didn't even realise the quality of player that you were marking at the time because I suppose Dublin were just only getting going so but when you think back of what the two boys have went on to achieve like it was, it was unbelievable so yeah like it was just a fantastic experience all around really and I don't think anybody could have seen you know what they would have achieved from then on which is just remarkable Absolutely yeah like and I suppose for yourself then kind of going through the years and everything else like looking at 2016 I mean that was sort of a a big breakout year for for Tipperary yeah. for most people anyway, especially for fans anyway. Watching on, maybe yourselves always sort of believe that you could go on a run or reach an All Ireland semi final or whatever. But I mean, it was a special special year, wasn't it? Obviously, getting to a Munster that final, was. All Ireland semi finals as well. Like it's, I suppose, unheard of for Tipperary football, um, but an unbelievable year nonetheless. I was like, it was, um, it was just the exposure. Like it was, like you said, I suppose it started off with, I suppose, beating Cork in the Munster semi-final in Turles. That was the first time we, like that group of players had beaten Cork in the championship. And we had mentioned that beforehand in the hotel. We were just like, you know, if we, if we don't beat Cork, you know, some of our careers may go down to Swanee a little bit and you might have some regrets. So we really wanted to, I suppose, tackle them head on that day. And we had a fantastic performance by the boys and um, the whole team involved. It was a fantastic win. And, you know that gets you into your first monster final and it was everyone on that panel at that time it was their first monster final appearance so it was fine you know it was great to get there obviously underachieved big time that day below in killarney like we were always going to be up against it but we definitely felt we kind of just didn't perform at all and we kind of had let ourselves down so it was the qualifiers for us and um you know while we went on to have a fantastic year it was that dairy game in the last round of the qualifiers that really kicked it off for us like we we came out i think we won the game by a point but like it was a really high scoring game end to end um you know and it was a fantastic victory and all of a sudden you find yourself in a quarter final like against galway and we just you know we just took it head on like we kind of felt of all the provincial champions you probably like to have gotten that year it would have been the Connacht and um, yeah we just we absolutely we were the better team on the day against Galway and like we you know we I think we ran out 10 point winners for a finish um, but that's definitely one of the performances that will will stick with us forever more you know what I mean um, winning an all Ireland quarter final by 10 points kind of pulling up literally at the finish line at your ease and the few hundred supporters that were there just making their way across I think they made their way across the back Terrace and um, across the Devon and over to the Hogan, it was just incredible. Like, and uh, talk about just soaking it in then for as long as we possibly could afterwards. And like, we were going into an All Ireland semi final then, and nobody had ever played in one of that level, so it was just fantastic time, really. And like you said, a good breakthrough year really for a lot of lads. 
Yeah, like, and you mentioned beating Cork as well. Like, I mean, your your record against Cork down the years has been fairly yeah. good. Obviously, you had the Munster final win, of course, in 2020, but even yeah, in the league yeah. as well. Like, is there is there uh, something when he's played Cork that he's kind of, I suppose, maybe the rivalry and everything else that goes into it? I think there's always been a huge yeah. sort of rivalry between Tipperary and Cork. Like, yeah, it, it's, it's not going to play a big part of yeah. it. Like, it's been good. It's been really healthy. Like, it's it's um it's definitely a fixture we feel like we can kind of we could turn the screw and i think we did like to be fair like we played in 2014 in the championship in the old parky Cueve, and we were controlling the game for i'd say 62 63 minutes we were in the lead and uh, aiden walsh comes off the bench then and kicks three points to kind of just steer them over the line but that was the point where we went, okay, like, you know, we, we could have won this game. We probably should have, but we're not a million miles away. Um, and then in 2016, that was the first time that group of players had beaten them. And then we bet them in 17 in the league, above in the new Parky Cueve. They bet us in 18 uh, by a point, a game above in Parky Ring that we should have won. Um, and then they bet us handy in 2019. Then we bet them in 2020. So... It's been kind of to and fro, like it's it's been a healthy competition, I would say, and a healthy rivalry, and one that we kind of we always look forward to because we always kind of feel like on any given day, if we perform at our best, we have a good chance of of beating them, um, you know, and that's just the way it has kind of unfolded for us, really, and it's great. It's a proper rivalry now, I would say. Yeah, and you mentioned beating Galway as you did by ten points and the comfortable victory there, and playing Mayo in an All Ireland semi final. Like, I mean, a team like Mayo that were really, really in their prime at that yeah. moment in time in terms of the likes of Lee Keegan, Andy Moore, and Aidan O'Shea, and it was like a very competitive game. It was a close game, and I suppose maybe yeah. a few decisions, maybe not going your way on the day, but it was. I mean, it was very, very competitive, and and no, certainly was, yeah. entertaining to watch. Yeah. Yeah, we went into that with massive confidence. Like we had a serious homework done, um, but they also had serious homework done as well, and that's probably what got them over the line. I suppose the one admirable thing about that particular team, that particular year, was the fact that no matter who they were playing against, they always had a strategy for whoever they were playing. So they obviously had a game plan and a style of play that they liked to play, but they had they were able to adapt for any type of opposition, and that was something that was really admirable about them that particular year whether it was us or whether it was Tyrone, the game previous or whoever in Connacht, they always had kind of a different plan, you know, kind of a horses for courses type thing. So, yeah, but listen, um, like I said, extremely confident going into that and we performed really well. Again, we were in the game up until maybe 62 or three minutes and uh, we get a red card and uh, we got a, an earlier black card with Robbie Kiley and, and that kind of took the sting out of the game for us. But, uh, Conor O'Shea then got the flukiest goal I've ever seen um, in championship like he, he literally pulled on the ball on the ground and it managed to creep inside the, the far post of Evan's goal and that was game set matched in with about six or seven minutes to go but yeah we were ultra competitive really happy with how we performed but listen just didn't get the rub of the green but that Mayo team were excellent like they were they were top class like um, we've actually played them three times now in their pomp and like you know um okay we were competitive but like you know they were they, they ran out comfortable winners for for a finish so yeah they were a class side for sure yeah i suppose the the look caught up with them anyway in the yeah. in the all autumn final with the two on goals and, yeah. and everything else like but um but yeah i suppose as you said like i mean playing against that side like in their pomp in their prime in crow park like, i remember tipperary i think won the all Ireland in, in hurling that year as well so there was a real sort of Say there was yeah, a huge 16, yeah. sort of around the county hurling football, like yeah. very rare for, for, yeah. for the county to have you know, it was. And, and like even finals. like, yeah, like we, we got a few all star nominees that year, and we actually had the pleasure of going to the all stars night. And um, you know, that was class, like especially because obviously you're meeting so many other players, but also because there was like a heap of temporary hurlers there as well. So it was nice to just mingle with all those guys and that type of a night. And, and then we had an all-star holiday that year as well over to Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So that was pretty class as well. And, you know, that was kind of just gave us a little bit of exposure and it's something we really enjoyed. And we kind of kicked on from there as well a little bit. But um, yeah, it was a fantastic year for sure. Memories that will will definitely live long in, in the memory, you know. What was Liam's, Liam Kearns like as a, as a manager? Top class, yeah. Um, really professional uh just a straight shooter he'd call it as it was if you were playing shite you'd be the first one to know but he'd also be fairly handy with the praise as well if it was 
if it was deserved and that's all you can ask for a manager is that he's honest and I suppose consistent and just straight up with you and that's exactly what he was what you saw is what you get and um, yeah he was really professional though like he, he knew what he wanted got good people around him it was good to delegate but he took no shit either and um, yeah he, he definitely he upped the standards big time in the county and within the squad and he just made sure that players maintained them and upholded them and yeah he was a major driving force that year like and obviously we, we might come to the 2020 success at some stage but like you know previous managers have had a lot to kind of to do with that success as well you know and previous players like you know it was building for a while to be fair and um, but yeah, he, he was massive for us at that time and yeah, he, he's definitely one of the top managers now to be fair to him. Yeah, how do you think he'll do at, uh, at Offaly? Obviously going in there as as manager, like I suppose, as you said, track record speaks for itself. So yeah. for Offaly fans, I'm sure they'll be very excited. Yeah, I, I think it's it, sh- it should be a great move for Offaly. I think, um, I think he's definitely the man who can bring them on now, I don't know what hand he's he, he's been dealt in terms of players available and, and things like that. I have heard of a few players that just aren't making themselves available this year for various reasons. So um, he probably, he may not be choosing from a full deck, but um, if Offaly are to progress um, even further than what they have, he's definitely he's definitely the right man for the job. But listen, who knows what can happen? Um, inter-county management can be a short can be a short lifetime these days, but yeah, he I reckon he'll do a good job. I definitely think he, he'll bring them on another little bit anyway, for sure. Yeah, because I suppose it's similar as well, isn't it, in, in some respects? I mean, obviously with yeah. yourselves, obviously winning a minor All-Ireland, Offaly obviously recently winning an under-20 All-Ireland, like he obviously was there sort of inheriting, you know, yeah. a lot of the lads sort of coming through from minor and under-20s from Tipperary, now doing similar with Offaly as well. So, I suppose yeah. he does have that experience of nurturing young talent and sort of getting the best out of them. Absolutely. Like when he came into Tipperary, like a lot of the foundation work had been done, a lot of the hard graft had been done, and he was kind of inheriting, let's say, a good crop of players. But, um, and he's kind of gone into the same, like you said, the same situation with, with Offaly. They have planted a lot of seeds in Offaly. They've had that bit of underage success now in both codes. Um, and they're an up and coming team. And, you know, they, they had a great league campaign last year and they did okay in the Talton Cup. So it's looking promising for Offaly. And like I said, he's he's inheriting a good team there with, you know, with, with good history um, recently. So um, hopefully now for their sake and, and Liam's sake, because he's a top man that he can bring to the next level. But um, hopefully not too much because we have to play him next year in the league. So. We'll be keeping a close eye on him at the same time, you know. Yeah, I suppose that'd be a bit like a, a derby match or something. There's, there's always a good bit of rivalry between Offaly and uh, and Tipperary as well, to be fair. Ah, yeah, there is. Yeah, should be should have been should be the makings of a good old game on there. Please God. Hundred percent. Yeah, and you mentioned the 2020 season there. I mean, that was a a hugely special season for Tipperary for for you know more than one reason and everything else and you obviously win the the monster title on the anniversary of course of bloody sunday and yeah. you know i mean a special special season i mean how do you sort of look back on it all now two years later um yeah it's kind of it's kind of hard to believe that the two years have got have come and gone like it's um it's just great i mean listen the memories will live forever like there's no doubt about that and it was just a fantastic year like we really I don't think any of us knew what we were getting ourselves in in for when when kind of twenty twenty struck us. Um, like people forget that we actually had to go back and play a two rounds of the league before that championship kicked off because they never got played. And uh, believe it or not, that was probably those two victories over. Um, it was Leeds and Offaly. I actually think yeah, those two lead those two victories actually probably kick started our campaign because we were out in championship the following week against Clare. So. Um, yeah, but listen, it was a fantastic year. Like, I mean, it was the stuff of dreams, really. You know, we've been waiting for so long to try and win Munster. And for a long time, you thought it would never come. But to some part, you always believed. And like, uh, if I'm being honest, I, I sensed something at the beginning of the lockdown. I said it to a manager or even a coach at the time. And I just said, like, there's something in the air here. I, I just feel like some team could come out and over here and, and cause an upset or two. And like, how right I was. And we weren't the only ones, Kevin as well, up in Ulster. So 
yeah, it was just incredible. Like like I said, for a long time it looked like it might never happen, but for it to actually happen then it was just incredible. Just relief was probably the first feeling that you got on the field that day, but after that then it was just sheer enjoyment and yeah, just great scenes to be fair. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned there, like, with 2020, like, it was sort of a, a bizarre year, like, and you had so many surprises, shocks, all the rest. So, I mean, you plenty of reason, really, to believe that, you know, anything crazy could sort of happen. And obviously, you're on that side of the draw, sort of avoiding Kerry and Cork, yeah. you know, not to discredit Actually, Air or Limerick awesome. or anything like that. But I think, you know, you obviously want to avoid Kerry anyway. I think every side of Munster does. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean... That year, you just kind of, you just kind of felt like, listen, we we're probably on the more favourable side of the draw. So I suppose, in a way, it was in our own hands. We we kind of felt, look, we could get to a final at the very least, you know. And then I suppose we had beaten Limerick in the semi final uh, on the Saturday evening, and then you're at home on the couch on the Sunday and you're watching Kerry and Cork, and all of a sudden Cork take out Kerry, and then you just start to kind of go, okay, hold on a minute now, like you know, this is definitely within. It's in our own hands here and if we prepare well enough over the next two weeks we've every chance of winning this match and that's how it panned out thankfully mm. and even in that like sort of game going in against cork like i mean what was the preparation like sort of leading into it leading into that monster final <laughs> they'd obviously come off the back of beating Kerry, and i think most people had them as overwhelming favorites i think mostly because of the fact that they just knocked out yeah. Kerry, who you know are sort of the dominant side really and in Munster, so what was the preparation like in the and the build up like leading into that Munster final? Yeah, like look, the preparation was top class, um, and it had to be because you know our biggest our biggest downfall sometimes is just you know is ourselves, and we just kind of maybe don't perform sometimes, or we just don't maybe prepare as well as we should have. But let's look, we left no stone unturned in that two week period because we knew that this was our one opportunity, and we weren't going to leave it behind. So. Preparation was just as good as I've ever seen it. And just, oh, to be honest with you, it was, it was mostly player, player driven because at the end of the day, we were the guys in the field that had to do the business. So, yeah, it, it was perfect. Um, I mean, listen, there was nothing else going on in our lives at, the, at that time. It was just maybe getting out to training and that was it and just making sure that you were doing everything right. And we certainly did. And even our preparation on the day, like you knew in the warm up, even when you looked at the opposition, you just knew we had them like in. I knew we that game we were probably going to win that game after about thirty seconds. I think you know Colin won the ball out in the midfield, kicked it into me. I was out won a mark and popped it over, and we we're just thinking we're on it here today, you know. And we never looked back after that. Um, and look, Cork were overwhelming favourites, I suppose. And like you said, they probably were because they had just taken out Kerry. But I suppose if you'd stripped it back a little bit and you dug a little bit deeper, you know you know, recent matches between ourselves and Cork, like we've discussed just there previously, there wasn't much between the two teams at any given day. So, um, you know, the the odds should have been a little bit shorter. But look, it was all playing into our hands as far as we were concerned. You know what I mean? Everyone was talking up, look, it's Cork's to lose and they've beaten Kerry, so they should handle tip. And that was fine for us. We just kind of went about our work quietly and we were just delivered a real professional performance on the day and I just thought we wanted the game we wanted the game a little bit more than they did on the day and um, thankfully we did because we came out on the outside of it for a change. Yeah, like I remember watching the game and even thinking like it, it did look although Cork did narrow the gap at different times and, and everything else, like it did look relatively comfortable at, at, at times, like even sort of towards the end of the game, there didn't seem to be a huge sort of moment or you know any panic sort of at the back or anything like that or or anything of that nature and probably did show like your maturity as a group and, and maybe the fact that you had that experience in 2016 probably really stood to you I'd imagine in this monster final yeah possibly like and listen like Cork are a great side like um you know they've beaten us as many times as we've beaten them and if we play it again tomorrow I don't know what way it would go but like you know we just we just really wanted it like i mean it was only our second ever monster final appearance you know we hadn't won a monster title in 85 years you didn't have to dig too deep for motivation a lot of people were asking me you know what is your motivation you're kind of going hold on a second we've been starved here you know what i mean we haven't won a monster title none of the no player in tipperary was alive that had won a monster title so that's how long it's been and you know like i said we didn't have to dig too deep for motivation we just our preparation was top class um, and I just thought our attitude on the day itself, just working really hard and doing the basics and 
we just played a really good brand of football that day and um, it suited us and like I said just sheer relief that we came out on the right side of it and um, yeah it was, it was one of the best days now on a sporting field that I've ever had so it was fantastic yeah and, and obviously as you mentioned there like in terms of it being COVID and everything else sort of empty stadiums I mean did it feel strange sort of walking out onto the pitch like in a Munster final like usually you'd obviously have that carnival atmosphere yeah. you know you'd sort of be doing the, the march around the the pitch like obviously with the with the band and everything else so how did it feel like in a, in an empty stadium like obviously when the final whistle blows it, I, i'm sure it doesn't matter at all like in that yeah. moment but like even sort of leading into the game like with an empty stadium like i'd say like most footballers fans everything else like it was a very very strange time for everyone yeah, it was there's no doubt about it um but you know what you, you just get on it like you just after a few minutes you're so focused on what you're doing on the field you just don't take any notice now, like for league matches with Tipperary, you wouldn't get too much too much of a crowd anyway. So like it's it's not something that would really affect our performance per se. But um, you would notice the silence. Like you could hear members of management speaking, and you could hear the subs very clearly shouting from the dugouts and and the stands. That's not something you would really be familiar with on a normal season because there'd be just that extra bit of noise. But do you know what, Aaron? It, it didn't make a whole pile of a difference. Um, you're just in the zone and you just get on with things and like even afterwards i know there was no one there and in a in a strange way it was kind of nice because it just made it so much more intimate for the players ourselves like we didn't have to be dealing with anyone or you know talking to anyone else it was just literally players management um and a few others and and that was it you could really soak it in and appreciate the space around you and just enjoy it to the max without being flooded by people which obviously would have been class as well don't get me wrong but um we kind of made the, the best out of a bad situation really so yeah it was grand you, you just got on with it really like it's gas we we couldn't have delayed leaving parky Cueve any more than we did like we just didn't want to leave because we were all going home separately um you know and we were all driving home separately and going home to our own home so like we were literally just hanging around the dressing room we got pizzas delivered uh, and just having the crack and soaking it in and you know that was probably one of the most enjoyable parts about it all because like i said it was just us just our, our management just that our group so that was nice to be fair yeah and being the the captain obviously as well you know walking up the steps to, to lift obviously the, the monster title like what's sort of running through your head at that time like when you're you're walking up the steps getting ready yeah. to, to to lift Tipperary's first monster title since 1935 like it's a very very rare occurrence for for most yeah. people as you said no one else alive you know would have would have experienced that previously so yeah it's unbelievable like it's it's probably actually look it's up there with one of my my top sporting moments i mean to win a Munster title was 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 always the dream for me, growing up. But to captain Tipperary too, it was just you know was it was an incredible achievement. It's something I'm extremely proud of, and you know I I'd love to get that experience again and and experience what that feels like one more time. Like it's 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 like a drug. This winning crack is just it's addictive. You know what I mean? You get a taste and you just you want more. But I suppose that particular day was just about composing myself. I I had no speech prepared. I didn't even think about it, to be honest with you. It was just going to be off the cuff, and it was. And I left out a few bits here and there. But um, listen, it's just about composure and enjoying it. Like, they wanted me to go up straight away. You know, there was lads there from the Munster Council pulling at you to go over. And, and I remember just turning to them and goes, listen, as will you just let me enjoy this for a few minutes? I'll be over in a few minutes. Just just give me a bit of time here. And to be fair, they did. And... Um, because I needed, like, I needed to, I waited so long, you just wanted to meet the boys and hug the lads and just soak it all in and, um, yeah, look, going up into the stand and making the speech to, you know, a small handful of people down on the pitch, again, was a little bit strange, but there was something nice about it as well and, um, yeah, it's just one of those moments that I, I'll take to the grave for sure, it's, it's one of my proudest, proudest ones now. Yeah, and obviously with it being the anniversary of of Bloody Sunday as well, and obviously the connection that has with Tipperary, like it's it is kind of mad looking back. Like I think sometimes when you look back at life, you think it's kind of crazy sometimes the coincidences that can sometimes throw themselves yeah. up and everything else. Like I'd imagine that as well. Like wearing the jersey, obviously as well. Like I mean, like just remarkable, really a remarkable story. Like when you factor that in yeah. as well, it was, and like all those things that you just mentioned. 
were per- potential banana skins for us going into that Munster final. You know what I mean? New Jersey's like to the weekend, you know, a hundred years on from when Michael Hogan was shot, um, the green and white jerseys and everything that went with it. Like, um, like they were, those were all potential excuses that we could have had if the game didn't go well. And, and they were potential banana skins. And like, I suppose as players and as management, we just had to control that as best we possibly could. And we did. And um, it's only when you go on and win the game, then that you can actually go back and reflect on the jerseys because they were lovely. They were fantastic jerseys, but they would have meant very little to us if we didn't win, you know? So winning the match was the most important thing. And only when you do that, then can you enjoy everything else that comes with it. And um, that's exactly what we did. And um, listen, it's, that jersey, jersey that I have now, it's, it's signed by the whole team, and it's you know it's hanging here in the sitting room, and uh, yeah, it's just everything about it was it was crazy. Like you you couldn't have wrote it. You know the stars were aligned. The four teams left in the championship were the exact four teams that were in the semi finals those years ago, and like it was just it was incredible. But um, listen, it wasn't to be. Uh, the semi final was the end of the road for us, but listen, it was a fantastic journey nonetheless. Yeah, and obviously getting getting another crack at a Mayo, like like you said, it probably didn't go your way on the day. But you know, as we've as we've mentioned before, like Mayo are a top top team, and and maybe at that time they had had a couple of retirements and everything else, a few younger lads sort of coming into the side. But no one's doubting their their quality and their ability. They went on to reach a, an all Ireland final a year later as well. Yeah. Like so, what was what was it like in in Crow Park playing them, and what were your memories of that game? Asher, my, my, my memories are, are extremely vivid. I can still remember most of it uh, quite clearly. Like playing in front, playing in Crow Park with 60 or 70,000, which was the last semi final, was incredible. But playing in front of in Crow Park with absolutely no one there is just as breathtaking. It was really weird. Um, this big, massive cauldron of a stadium with nobody in it, um, with just literally four big walls, it, it, it was crazy. And then the mist started to come down and uh, I know from just hearing from other people, visibility from the television w- was quite difficult, but it wasn't an issue uh, on the night. But um, ah, listen, it was look, we got two great goal opportunities early doors, and myself and Michael just didn't take them. And then you know we concede four or five goals, four in the first half or whatever it was in the first half. You're never going to win a match at that level if you concede that amount of goals and you don't take your opportunities at the other end. So it was just one of those days where. You know, it was the game was over at half time. I addressed that in the dressing room. It was over at half time. We were never going to claw it back, but we had a lot of pride to kind of restore the jersey. The first half performance just wasn't good enough, and that's all I wanted the boys to do in the second half was just go out and win the second half and perform and throw off the shackles. And we did that. I don't know. I think we won the second half by a couple of points, and we just put a bit of you know a bit of gloss on the scoreboard. That's all we could have done. But yeah, at the end of the road um, for us. But listen, fantastic journey and like. Obviously, bringing the wreath over into the corner where Michael Hogan shot collectively as a team was just a special poignant moment as well. Um, you know, that was nice. It was difficult, all right, because you had to go from losing, you know, one of the biggest matches in your life to going back to a normal person and, and doing the right thing and showing a bit of respect. So it was difficult enough to make that switch so quickly. But listen, um, it had to be done. And yeah, it was a nice moment. And there's some nice images of here as well at home. So it, it, it was it was nice for sure. Yeah, and obviously you were talking there about like the mist and, and everything else, and it was definitely quite difficult at times to watch on the TV. But like I suppose with it being in winter as well, and the fact that it was obviously a lockdown, like nobody was out, that you wouldn't have heard cars or anything like that. Like I'd say it was just an eerie silence in many ways with the mist sort of dawning in as well. Like as you said, like a unique experience that's probably well, I suppose hopefully anyway is never going to happen yeah. again. Oh, yeah, definitely like you. Look, you, you, like I said earlier on, you could hear the subs in the stands roaring and shouting at their teams. You could hear the managers clearly what they were saying. But you could hear every other player as well roaring and shouting at their teammates. And like that's that's the only way I can describe it. Like it was, um, I wouldn't say it had a challenge match feel to it because that's just not giving it the respect it deserved. But like there was no crowd, like it was just 15 on 15. Um, but I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed all the games that year. I don't know what it was about it, but the crowd, the lack of crowds just didn't bother me. And you just get on with it and, you know, you make the, the best of a bad situation. And we did for that majority of that year. We, we certainly did, but just weren't good enough on the day. That's the bottom line to beat Mayo. Like I said, they're a class side. And, um, you know, they've been unlucky themselves not to win in all Ireland, let's be honest, on a couple of occasions. So, you know, but like, you know what, Aaron? 
like it's been an incredibly successful time for Tipperary football. Like we've played in two Munster finals, we've won one of them. We've we bet Galway in a quarter final. We've played in two All Ireland semi finals. You know, um, not many not many county teams can say that. Not that, not at the top bracket anyway. So, you know, the last ten years, while there have been lots of ups and downs and stuff like that, um, you know, we've been blessed and I suppose lucky to be part of probably the most successful time for this team and. Um, as a footballer in Tipperary, it definitely was probably the best time to be involved. And listen, I've no, I've no doubt there's more to come. Um, you know, like our, our biggest issue is that we probably just lack that bit of consistency and backing up a good year with another good year. So um, once we get that right, I think, you know, I think we'll be a more consistent team. And we need to be operating at, in the top two divisions of the league as well. I mean, we've yo-yoed from four to three to two to three to four, back to two. So... We just need that bit of consistency now in our performances and um, again, look, hopefully that will come in time but yeah, it's been a fantastic time in general and um, I'm just honoured and privileged to be a part of it really, you know. Yeah, like and I suppose how influential was even having the likes of Colin O'Reardon back and obviously Mickey Quinlevin, what a, what a year from him, Brian Fox, these type of lads, I mean, so many great, great performers for, for Tipperary that year. And obviously, Colin O'Reardon coming back from, from AFL during that period of time. Like, I mean, imagine it was great sort of seeing him back, you know, in round Tipperary circles once again. Yeah, it was. And that was another thing with the lockdown. We got a few players back that we probably didn't expect. Michael had planned to go travelling. Um, those plans changed. Colin came home. He was actually home for the semi-final, but he wasn't planning on playing. And then you get to the final and, and things change and um, circumstances change. And, you know, Liam Casey was around that year. He's another player that's gone. And, you know, we just had, we had the best of football players in Tipperary available to us at that year and they were on the pitch. And that's the bottom line. Um, and that's been another factor over the years. We just, for whatever reason, we just, we just never seemed to have our best footballers on the field together collectively at one time. And the one year we did have it, was probably one of our better years. So there's always been talent there. Um, and having those lads back that year was just incredible. They just probably gave us that little extra edge that we were missing in previous years, you know. Yeah, like, and, and imagine, as you said, like Mickey Quinlevin obviously going away traveling and Colin Reardon going back to uh, the AFL and obviously a few other retirements and everything else. Like, I'd imagine that probably has been a, a big factor in the fact that he's obviously got relegated in 2021 from Division 3. Alongside Cavan, who obviously, as we said, funnily enough, won an Ulster title on the same day. He was won a Munster yeah. title. So, like, I remember when that happened, and it, it did surprise a lot of people. I mean, the National League is very competitive, so you can understand sometimes yeah. why these things happen. But I suppose at the same time, it, it probably was a bit of a disappointment, as you said, going from Division 2, 3, and obviously down to 4. Yeah, I was. There's no doubt about it. Like, um, I suppose you're coming off the back of this wonderful season and um, you know, you've experienced success to that degree and you just want to continue it on. And to be honest with you, um, I felt we were going into the following year in, in good shape and um, in a good place. But um, I suppose looking back now, hindsight is great, but we probably weren't as better, best prepared as we probably could have been. Um, and like, yeah, losing a player here and there was definitely a factor, but, the reality of it is we just weren't playing good enough. What we were doing on the training field, um, and in particular on match day, it just wasn't good enough. Like we, we were never gonna beat teams the way we were playing. And it's only when you think back now to what we were doing, it just wasn't good enough and it wasn't at the level required to even beat division three teams. So that's the main problem. You know, you just need to you need to be playing at a certain level and you need to be receiving a certain amount of coaching and you need to be getting the right guidance and playing in a way that suits the players that are on the pitch. And uh, we just weren't doing that the previous, the following year. So um, that's something we'll definitely be aiming to get right now going forward this year, especially. Yeah. One man, I suppose we didn't mention actually was obviously the manager of Tipperary right now, David Power. I mean, obviously he was the man sort of in charge during that, that minor football championship win yes. back in, in 2011. And I mean, how key has he been to the success, success as well? Like I'd say, Obviously, he's played a, a big, big role there as well. He has. David's been great, to be fair. He, he's a top man and a great manager. And listen, I mean, his CV speaks for itself. I mean, the All-Ireland success in 2011, uh, the Munster senior title in 2020, 
you know, and you could say a lot about what we've said there with Liam Collins inheriting good teams. David inherited good teams as well. Like he knew in 2011 that there was a good crop of player coming, and you know he took that job on that minor job when I don't think too too many other people were putting their hand up, and um, he got his just rewards. And then you know he was he got the Tipperary senior gig, which is probably you know the best job you can get. And um, in his first year, he he delivered success. So. He's been massive to it, and um, you know he he surrounds himself with good people, like like most good managers do, and you know he's a good people person to be fair. And beneath it all, he, he's a good Tipperary football man. He absolutely loves it. His, his family is steeped in tradition here, uh, Kilsheila, Kilcash, and, and Tipperary, and um, yeah, he he's been fantastic and a good guy as well. So yeah, he's in charge of us now this year as well. This is his fourth season. So look, we'll all be looking to make um, make strides again this year and, and drive on. Yeah, and as you said there, obviously getting promoted back into back into Division Three for next year. Like, how's twenty twenty three looking in in your book? Like, what's the sort of aims, ambitions, goals, and and everything else? It's looking tough, as well. It's looking. I don't know if you've seen the fixtures for Division Three. It's Jesus. It's it's extremely tough. I think there's four northern teams in there. We have to go away to uh, we have to go away to two of them. We're going away to Cavan and Fermanagh. So there's two tough trips. We have to play Offaly. We have to play Down. There's some tricky, tricky games in there, so there's no, there's no gimme of a game there. So our first game is is down. It's a home game. Um, listen, our performances at home aren't exactly they wouldn't scare you. So I don't think down will fear too much coming down to Semple Stadium. But you know we've an awful lot of work to do between here and then. We've made a good start. Um, you know we've a new coach on board. We've some new players on board. So there's a bit of fresh freshness to things at the moment. Um, so hopefully we can continue this good bit of training that we're doing at the moment and, and just get off to a good start because we need to, you know, you can't start Division 3 with a loss or two losses because it just makes things virtually impossible. So a good start is vital. And <clears throat> listen, after that, once the league, we'll deal with the league first and then we've walked from the first round of the championship. But honestly, and I know everyone says it, Aaron, but you can't be looking too far ahead. We have an awful lot of work to do physically and tactically before we can even talk about you know where we're going to go or where we're going to get to but all i'm hoping for is that we can drive standards and increase the standards and make sure that the new guys coming in are aware of what's required to be a top player and a top trainer and um i suppose as captain as a senior team as a senior player that's my job as well so that's what i'll be hoping to do going forward in the coming weeks anyway yeah, we'll run through some quick fire questions here. You can answer them as short or as long as you like. Yeah. Um, biggest idol growing <laughs> up can be from any sport. Sorry, was that biggest idol? Uh, biggest idol, yeah, like sporting yeah. idol. Can, can be from any sport, doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be from Gaelic football. Yeah, look, GA, obviously, I'm on record for saying I used to love the Gooch and Declan O'Sullivan for Kerry. I just think, and Paul Galvin, those are my three favourite forwards from that time period. I used to love watching those guys, those are class. I was lucky enough to play against all three of them as well. So, um, yeah, other than that, I'm a big Ronaldo fan, even though he's he's let me down now the last few weeks. But listen, he's still a legend. Um, so, yeah, look, other than that, those those be my kind of, my GA men and anyway, those three carry boys, those three or four carry lads. Yeah, um, I suppose I was going to ask their player from another sport that you'd look up to, but I suppose Ronaldo, he's definitely Yeah, just, just for his sheer longevity and his professionalism, like I know he he's he's full of himself. He's arrogant. He wants to be the main man all the time. He wants to be tops. Like you see him last night. He wanted that goal even though he didn't touch the ball. Like and he's still cribbing about it. That's just his desire. I know it wills people at times, and he can be a little bit over the top. But I just I just admire his drive, and he's just like he's whatever he is. Is he thirty seven, and he's in the shape of his life, and he's still trying his best, and he still wants to be the main man, and I can appreciate that. You know, I'm I'm probably the score getter on our team, and like I would share a lot of qualities in terms of I always want to be the top scorer, and I want to get you know as many scores as I possibly can. So it's just something I've always admired about the men over the years. Yeah, favorite TV show? Um, oh God, I don't know. Um, Friends is always an easy watch. I was a big fan of Friends when I was younger. But yeah. listen, um, I used to love um, I loved Breaking Bad on Netflix. I've actually watched it twice. It was class. Um, ah, uh, yeah. I, I don't really know. Have I a favorite one? Would you believe I'm just finished Games of Thrones? Game of Thrones there not so long ago. 
Um, I watched it properly. I watched eight seasons in about four weeks. I'm absolutely wrecked from it. That was class as well, to be fair. Yeah, I actually haven't watched Game of Thrones, but Breaking Bad now, I've, I've watched that twice as well. Yeah. Better Call Saul as well is a, is a very good one. Yeah, I've watched. Yeah, it's decent as well, to be fair. In terms of the, the Tipperary panel then, like who would be the, the joker or, or I suppose the, the man like pulling the, the jokes in the Tipperary panel? Oh, we had a few. Philip Austin was a good man for, for a bit of banter there. He's gone. Um, Kevin Fahey thinks he's funny at the moment. Yeah, he kind of is a little bit. Shawnee O'Connor, the younger guys, the Clamel contingent there, think they're funny. Um, they are, I suppose, in their own way. I don't really get it now myself, but uh, yeah, they're guest men, right? Yeah, and then I, I suppose your your best moments on the on the pitch. Obviously, we we spoke about twenty twenty, but any other sort of memories or, or or anything else, maybe a club level that I suppose you'd look back at and and be super proud of. Asher, sure, listen, like obviously twenty sixteen and twenty twenty are well documented for being kind of fantastic years for us. But you know, twenty fourteen was probably one of my best years in a Tipperary jersey, like. Um, uh, it was just, it was a good, it was kind of a breakthrough year for us in terms of we got it, we won Division Four, um, we got to the last twelve of the All Ireland, um, you know, um, I think I was third highest score in the championship that year, highest score in Division Four, but that was the first time I probably considered myself um, a proper inter county footballer. It was twenty fourteen, my whole mentality changed that year, and I just probably kicked on from there and never looked back. So that was that was probably one of my my earliest memories, um, look, the sideline, the free from the sideline against Limerick in 2020 to get us to that final, yeah, that's probably a massive moment. Um, and then obviously just lifting the cup above and uh, Parky Grieve is probably the one that stands out. Brilliant, Connor. Well, look, I appreciate you jumping on. Much, much appreciated. And um, yeah, well, look, best of luck anyway for, for next year in, uh, in 2023 in Division 3. And Hopefully, anyways, you can go on a run. And I know as a Dublin fan, it would be great to see his be Kerry. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, cheers very much. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, no problem, Aaron. All the best. Thanks for having me on.